Thank you very much, Yasmina. This morning I'll be talking about 802.11n and what it means to you. It's actually my hope that this can be the first in a series. So I've, uh, as I was putting this program together, I was thinking about how to cover the basics and what we might do beyond that point. So if you have questions, it may be that the most appropriate thing for me to do is to put together a whole follow-up if you ask a really profound question. And really profound questions are okay. They're actually a lot more fun. So let's start off and um, who am I? I mean, I obviously know who I am. Maybe even you know who I am. Um, as Yasmina said, um, I'm probably best known in, in Wi-Fi for writing the two books for O'Reilly that, that many people have used. I've had a number of uh, leadership positions in the industry that have given me a, a set of wonderful experiences that are great fun to talk about. I'm currently the chair of a couple of task groups at the Wi-Fi Alliance regarding security, which thankfully most of the time is very boring, although um, not so much this year in the wake of DEF CON. I also spent some time as the chair of the current 802.11 revision, which came out in March of this year, which means that around about September you'll be able to get your free copy from the IEEE Get802 program, and you'll be able to, to go right to the, the front page and see all of the people who were involved in the production of that draft. As much fun as these things are, writing books and participating in the development of the technology, it is unfortunate that um, I can't make a living doing that. So I do have a day job. I work as a product manager on operating system technology for Arrowhive Networks, and that's how I actually bother to feed myself. I just get to do stuff like this for fun. Some people may be asking why um, the, the photo that I've displayed of myself has the sunglasses. Um, it's a long story. Let's just say it's a thing. So this morning, really the, the agenda is pretty simple. What I want to do is talk about how 802.11n goes faster and the technology that we've had to develop as an industry to make that happen. Some really introductory comments about um, what you might do to build an 802.11n network. That's a whole huge topic in and of itself, which might be uh, a good set area for questions and follow-up. I've um, tried to keep it at a reasonably high level this morning, uh, but if you have questions, feel free to go ahead and ask them. And then I wanted to close with a, um, with a discussion of what we're doing to make uh, wireless LANs even faster. The IEEE is a group that never stands still, and we have the roadmap to a gigabit well in hand, and that's something that um, is often a topic of conversation, and um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about that just to give you an idea for what we're going and how the technology that came out in 802.11n is continuing to drive the industry forward. So the first thing is, why are people interested in 802.11n? And the answer almost always comes down to speed. I like things to go fast. Or it's better to get bits faster than slower. Fast is generally better than slow in networking. 802.11n is a little bit different from what's come before. And there are a few areas in which the technology is radically different. And this is sometimes hard to appreciate if all you do is use a network. That um, an 802.11 interface, the operating system will put bits into one end of the link, they'll come out the other end, and it's not always clear what's going on in the middle. But yet something obviously is because um, you're getting them through the interface faster. 802.11n has a couple of important techniques that are interesting to know about. The most widely understood one, or the most widely known one, is this idea of MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. Something else that's pretty widely understood um, is the idea that you can use wider channels. So just, um, just like um, <clears throat> 
the way that a road with more lanes works to carry more traffic, um, wider channels also carry more traffic. Although the physical layer aspects of 802.11n are probably better known, there's also an important set of enhancements um, at, the, at the MAC layer, at layer two. 802.11n um, is really, it crosses the boundary between the PHI and the MAC. There are new physical layer characteristics that are important, but if you actually look at the standard itself, and you, you take the several hundred pages that it is, what you'll find is that a substantial portion of that is due to making the MAC more efficient. When you get right down to it, 802.11 is a way of allocating access to the medium. You have this, this radio medium for transmitting networking data, and it's shared. Everybody who is on the same channel has to coordinate access to the radio medium, and only one device can be talking at once. 802.11 works by allocating um, the time you're allowed to talk. And wireless LANs are interesting because it's possible for the amount of time you need for a transmission to vary radically depending on the distance you, you are at. And much of the technology development in 802.11 is devoted to managing the amount of time a device uses to transmit data um, so that it does not interfere with other devices on the network. So let's go ahead and talk about each of these in turn. First, MIMO is, uh, it is often discussed as the big innovation behind 802.11n, and it is. It's the reason why 802.11n exists. Um, and every physical layer that has come out in the Wi-Fi networking world has contributed a new big idea. With 11n, it was this idea of MIMO. In prior versions of 802.11, those are the, the well-known A, B, and G, topping out at 54 megabits, when you went to use a radio channel, you transmitted one stream of bits through the radio channel. And what I've done here is I've illustrated that by finding a picture of a two-lane country highway. And you'll notice um, as I talk about things and illustrate them with photos that each of these slides has a, an attribution at the bottom. Um, these are all Creative Commons licensed photos on, on Flickr, and it's a wonderful way to, to help get my point across. Um, when I was, was chair of the 802.11 revision, um, one of the things that I was known for was trying to find a picture on Flickr that described how I thought uh, the task group that I was leading was progressing, and I would use that as the headline status update. Um, so it's something that I've, I've liked doing. There's a lot of great imagery out there, and it's just fun to, to look at really high-quality, compelling images. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I may often have to describe why I've picked an image, but it's just fun looking at the work of talented photographers. In contrast to the, um, that single two-lane highway, um, let's say you want to increase speed on, on that. You can measure the throughput of a highway in terms of the number of um, either cars, vehicles, um, or even people that pass a given point. Um, when you want to increase the speed of this, of this highway that has one lane in each direction, it's possible to increase the speed at which cars travel. You can raise the speed limit. But there's only so far you can do that. It requires that the individual cars on the road get better and better about reacting, and at some point you reach the limit of what human drivers are capable of. And in some states you will reach that much faster than others. I'm sure that everybody on the webcast thinks they are surrounded by the worst drivers in the world. I know that I do. Once you reach the limit of the highway in terms of cars travel as fast as they, they are capable of doing safely, really the, the best way to increase the speed is to widen the highway. And that's why there is the, the picture of the, of the superhighway on the right. 
that has higher throughput because it's possible to have vehicles traveling in parallel and um, that increases the, the number of um, both packets, if you will, in terms of if we use the, the analogy where a packet is a car, and the contents are bits. So yes, um, as I've shown two pictures to illustrate MIMO, I really am serious about that, that this is um, a good analogy for the way that um, the, the way that MIMO works to increase throughput. Um, here, um, there's no image attribution for, for this um, figure, and in fact, I've, I've taken it from the 802.11n survival guide that's recently been published by O'Reilly. This is a very simple diagram, where on the left we have, again, that single input, single output, that's how 802.11a, b, and g work, that you have an active antenna on each side, the bits have to go between them, and um, you're limited by how well you can make that radio channel work. Whereas in the MIMO scenario on the right, you have um, multiple output antennas, so in this case there are four, and on the other side you have multiple input antennas, and each of those data streams travels over the same radio channel at the same time. Now this picture is intentionally simplified in that it shows each data stream going over a pair of antennas. And it doesn't exactly work like that. Um, the way that you determine how separated out the data streams are depends on an incredible amount of, of calculus and signal processing theory. So that's, that's a very simple picture. Um, in reality, what you're looking for is um, a way to find an independent path between the sender and the receiver. And it might go across a one antenna pair, as it's shown um, conceptually here. But it's also possible to use this sophisticated signal processing technology to have a single data stream travel across uh, multiple antennas. So then it may be that two antennas um, help create an independent path. And as long as um, it's possible to separate these out, um, you, can, um, you, you can transmit in parallel and, and increase the speed. So this idea of data streams is very important. The number of streams is often an important component of um, working with 802.11n because unlike previous versions of 802.11, um, with 802.11n it's such a big standard that it took a while for individual components of the standard to be implemented. And in the case of standards development, it's often much easier to start off with simple technologies and the way that you would um, write um, the standard to have, say, two data streams is not all that different from the way you would write a standard to have four data streams. However, if you go talk to your favorite chip designer, those are two very different problems. And designing a chip that's capable of multi-stream operation is much harder. You have all of the individual components in the radio right next to each other, and they, they interfere with each other um, just as you have um, the uh, radio signals being picked up um, by, um, if you have two radio stations uh, close together, they will interfere with each other. The same can be true of um, two um, receivers or transmitters in a MIMO system. And there's a lot of work that goes into preventing that interference just at the, the chip design level. Conceptually, a data stream is very simple. It's a channel that you use over the air, um, and 11N uh, gets its great advantage in speed by being able to transmit these in parallel. So you take the same channel that you've always used, and rather than transmitting at, um, say, 50 megabits, then you can transmit at a little bit faster, because there are some improvements, but you transmit multiple channels or multiple data streams over the, the channel at the same time. 
roughly speaking, um, each data stream can go up to 150 megabits. And so the first devices that came out on the market supported two streams. Uh, the devices which are currently widely shipping right now support three streams. And the way that you'll often see this written is that you have this notation where you have um, two numbers with an X in the middle. So you have T by R, where you have the number of transmitters, the number of receivers. And frequently those are the same. Um, they don't always have to be. Um, the key number is really the number of data streams. You can have a 3x3 three three MIMO system that only supports two stream operation. The reason why you might want to have more um, transmitters and receivers than you have data streams is because of this, this idea of correlation that I talked about. Um, <clears throat> When you have two data streams going over the, um, over the same channel, you're, what you're really looking for is for them to be independent, that you want to be able to transmit a bit down one of these streams and not have any crosstalk with any of the others. Um, generally speaking, for this to happen, you have to have the radio waves bounce off of something. This was most memorably put in the review of the 802.11n book by one of my reviewers who said, in space, um, you have, um, you have um, no correlation between any streams you have because there's nothing to bounce off of. And so nobody can hear you scream. Um, that's the reason why I took the picture of the space station and put it there. Um, I, if, if you, as you get to know me, you'll realize that I really like the space program and I have wanted to be an astronaut for a very long time. Um, I had to go into Wi-Fi instead. Because you're trying to work with correlation um, and you're trying to make sure that you have um, paths that are independent, one of the strange things about 802.11n as far as network design that you'll see is that um, <clears throat> previously, if you had two paths that um, interfered with each other, um, they might lead to a weaker signal and cause problems. Um, now this is actually a good thing because if they're that independent, you can put different bits down each of them and it actually helps to increase throughput. Something else that you can do with um, having multiple data streams is something called maximum ratio combining. And this works when you have um, a lot of transmitters and a lot of receivers, but only a small number of streams. Uh, one area where this is useful technology is that um, many mobile devices, so if you have your tablet, computer, or your phone, it may be 802.11n, but it might only be a single stream 11n device. Um, and um, this, um, <clears throat> what this lets you do is it, just like you have um, the ability to hear where a sound comes from when you use both ears. And um, one of the problems I had growing up as a child is I had a lot of ear infections. And as a result, I'd often be congested. And I could, I could hear that there was a sound, but I wasn't always good at telling which direction it was coming from. Um, thankfully, I grew out of that. Uh, what happens as you age is that your face gets longer and the eustachian tubes are no longer horizontal. Um, so it's, it's magic. I remember my ENT telling me, oh, you'll grow out of it when you're 14. And it took a little while longer for me to do that because I had to, I guess my face had to get sufficiently long. Um, you do the same thing in 802.11n. Um, by having more antennas to listen in your MIMO system, it gives you a bit of a gain in terms of what you're able to receive. And you can use that to get farther away from the AP. Um, you can also use it to increase speed. So um, in, the, in the figure here, um, what you see is that, um, let's say we're, we're using a two-stream device. So it's a, it's a standard first-generation 802.11n product. Um, and you want to measure 
how the speed of that link varies with distance. So as, you, as you're very close to the AP, you have maximum speed. And then you can get farther away from the AP gradually. And what will happen is that you get to a point at which you can no longer use the top speed. And then as you increase distance, the speed starts going down. If you had a system that was exactly the same as yours, um, that would happen at a certain critical distance, which is, is shown by the, the solid curve. You see that at some point you reach a distance, it starts going down. Now, if you were taking your device and using that to, um, to talk to a device, to, a, to say an access point that had um, three receivers on it, even though you, you only have one, it still gives you a bit of a gain, and that lets you go farther. And this is the dashed line in the picture that um, having the ability to listen in more points allows you to, to perform that lookup um, or that, that, that correlation, decorrelation much more effectively. And that can, that can be used in a couple of different ways. Um, one is that at a given distance, you see that vertical red line that says additional speed. If you're able to listen better, it means that you can, can use a higher speed. The other way it's used is that um, because it gives you um, additional gain um, in, the, in the reception, it means that you can move farther away and get the same speed, and that's the horizontal line. You can combine it to a certain extent. Um, I often talk about this as being kind of like a balloon that you put a certain amount of air in the balloon, you can squeeze it one way and you can get more speed, you can squeeze it the other way, you can get more range, but you can't get both at the same time to the same extent. Next up, uh, the next big enhancement in 802.11n was channel width. So here, I've got an example of real-life channel width. On the left, we have a satellite image of the Bosphorus Strait. And this is uh, basically the city of Istanbul you see at the bottom of the picture. Um, the Bosphorus is very narrow. And there's a limited amount of shipping traffic that you can get through that strait. Whereas if you compare this to um, the Great Lakes in America, they're much, much bigger. Now, they're connected with small canals, but um, if you think of the ability to sail from one end of um, either the strait or a lake, um, that you're able to, to fit much more traffic across, and the Great Lakes are able to carry a lot more shipping than the Bosphorus Strait. And this is the exact same key that we use in 11N with wider channels. And I've seen a couple of questions on this topic. So um, I'll, I'll start off um, by you know, making a couple of observations. Um, one is that, yes, this is new technology in 11N. Um, we previously had um, channels that were about 20 megahertz wide. Um, and in 11N, they can go up to 40 megahertz. Um, part of the reason that they were that they started off at 20 is that it was, um, in 11A, it was what the regulations demanded. There's a lot that we do in Wi-Fi that um, is based on um, the rules that are, are there for accessing the radio medium. The Wi-Fi industry depends a tremendous amount on having access to what's called unlicensed spectrum. In many countries, um, in order to transmit on the radio, you need to have a license. You need to have permission from the government to do it. Um, your mobile phone um, has to get a license from the government, and then they, they are able to use that frequency and keep people off it. Um, the same is true of television and radio broadcasting, which is why you're always able to dial in and tune in the station that you want. Um, with Wi-Fi, one of the key decisions that was made that enabled Wi-Fi to be the technology it is, is that it's unlicensed. Anybody can buy a Wi-Fi AP and put it up. Now, the catch is that many governments will um, 
as part of that say, you don't need a license, but only if you follow these rules. And oftentimes there will be rules about maximum power that are set very low. Um, there are rules about channel width as well. Um, and the rules can change over time, but as the standards group develops something, it has to take into account the rules of the time. And so 802.11a used 20 megahertz channels. Um, <clears throat> With 802.11n, the rules were changed a little bit and it became possible to use wider channels. And part of what happened is that Wi-Fi became such a compelling and interesting technology that uh, the people who make up these rules for access to the radio in throughout the world wanted to help Wi-Fi and make it easier to, to use and to make it a higher speed technology. Um, the trade-off that you get when you use wider channels is um, that there is a certain amount of capacity um, and that by using a channel that's twice as wide, you get half as many. Um, you may be able to support better applications um, because you have a higher data rate, but it means that you have to be a little more careful about how you lay out channels. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in the planning session of this talk. The third area where 802.11n worked to increase the speed is something called aggregation. And this is what happens um, at the MAC layer. So we're no longer talking about physical layer attributes here. We're talking about the ways in which frames get built and transmitted. Um, and the, the example that I give is that this is sort of like carpooling for data that I've got two pictures here. On the left-hand side, there's a traffic jam. You have a bunch of individual packets represented here by cars, and there are so many of them that they're kind of stuck. And in order to use the road, you need to keep a cushion of space around your car because two cars can't occupy the same space. On the right, we're able to put these packets together into a much larger container. and um, you still need to have space around the vehicle, but because it's a big container ship, um, it's possible to be much more efficient by packing together a lot of data into something that is uh, much larger. And that's, that's one of the biggest container ships in the world. Um, I, I feel very lucky that I was able to find a picture of it. How this actually works in 802.11 is <clears throat> that you wind up taking the IP packets from your IP stack, and then it's, you, these get put together into what's called an aggregate frame. So you see that process being done here where you have IP packets coming down from the stack. They get put together into um, what are called subframes. And the cool thing about a subframe is that it is an individual frame and it works just like any other frame with one, with one critical exception. So you see the IP packets being assembled into subframes. You see the subframes being stuck together. Um, all of the subframes can then be put together in a big aggregate frame. And the aggregate itself um, then is um, able to be transmitted as one continuous operation. The reason this is very powerful is that 802.11 works by allocating time. You get a certain amount of time to transmit. And one of the most expensive things in the 802.11 protocol is getting the right to transmit on the radio. The fewer times you have to do that, the better it is. So you build this aggregate frame, and it's possible to, to get the access to the radio medium once, and then transmit this entire aggregate, which may be composed of a lot of frames at very high speed, and you can just do them one right after the other without pausing. In the case of 802.11n, a very large aggregate frame at a very high data rate can be put together and actually be easier to transmit than a standard 1500 by Ethernet frame using 802.11b data rates because that aggregate is at such a high data rate, it doesn't take very much time at all. The purpose of aggregation is to um, continue to improve the efficiency, the ratio of the time you spend transmitting data to the time you spend contending for the medium, putting frames in place, 
um, and having all the overhead to detect um, to, to detect frames and um, do all of the, the link operation um, <clears throat> that you have to do in a networking protocol. A common question that often gets asked about 802.11 specifications is how fast is this? The great thing about wireless is that as an engineer, I always get to say, well, the speed of a wireless network depends. And it gets to depend on all kinds of things. And so that allows me to, to talk about what the speed depends on. Um, <clears throat> one of my favorite things to do when I first started talking about 802.11n was to take the draft of the standard that was out there at, the, at, at, at that time and I would pull out the pages that had the tables for how fast it goes because there were 10 or 12 pages that were just full of tables that said, if you have this channel width and this number of streams and this coding rate, here's the, the speed. And I could say, this is how you answer the question. It's this many pages. But generally speaking, what you'll hear is people using a, a summary where um, they're they may answer the question depending on, in, in a couple of different ways, depending on their approach. One common way is people will say, oh, this is 100 megabits. And the reason for that is that was the original goal of 802.11n. It was started off as um, a way of um, getting to fast Ethernet speeds over the air. And that's the speed you get after you take into account all of the overhead that goes into doing 802.11. The other speeds you typically hear are um, 300, uh, 450, and 600 megabits, where <clears throat> um, these are, if you use the wider channels, um, it's the maximum speed of a two-stream, three-stream, or four-stream device. Now, in reality, what's going on in the market right now is that if you want to buy an 802.11n device, um, you really are picking between two and three stream devices. Um, there are some devices that have four antennas, but they still only support three streams. And it's interesting to see whether or not that will ever become a shipping product. So with all that out of the way, that's how 802.11n works. I've talked a little bit about what it means for planning your network. Um, let's dive into a couple of um, key differences between 802.11n and, um, and previous standards. And a lot of this starts off with thinking about this as a project. Um, depending on um, why you're looking at doing an 802.11n upgrade, um, it might be um, that you need to justify this to um, another organization that has the budget for this. <clears throat> um, and you can talk about 802.11n in terms of how fast it goes um, if you have applications that depend on having large data transfer. It may be that you can talk about this in terms of capacity, that because 802.11n is faster, um, it means that each individual user is using less airtime. And so therefore, um, it's possible to increase the number of people served by the network uh, while not decreasing the experience they have. Uh, there are some applications where it's important to have range. That in, for example, a warehouse, um, that maximal ratio combining that I talked about, because that increases range, it's possible to use fewer APs and therefore save on the cost of a deployment. part of the project plan that you, you would have to put together, and this doesn't have to be an incredibly formal document, um, <clears throat> is that you want to make sure that you know what's actually going to be used on the network. And this, is, this used to be much easier. When I started working in Wi-Fi, people connected laptops, they did email, they did web browsing, and that is um, so long in the past that it's a, it's, it's a far more interesting time to be building a Wi-Fi network right now. That um, any device that's interesting has Wi-Fi, and in fact it may only have Wi-Fi. You think of, the, of what's going on with the number of people who use tablets even as a, almost a primary device for 
um, doing general office work, um, the number of phones that are on Wi-Fi or that carriers are encouraging to be on Wi-Fi because they consume so much data. There are various kinds of cameras, um, whether it's um, for photographers sending, image, sending images over a network to storage or security cameras. Um, the number of devices per user is no longer one and it hasn't been for a while. And as these new devices come out, it means that you need to plan for a fairly healthy growth in terms of the um, amount of data that you expect to be consumed. And um, that depends a fair bit on what people are actually doing with the network and what you think they might be doing in the future. Something else which is often important to talk about is security. And 802.11n doesn't radically change the security architecture of the Wi-Fi protocol, um, with one exception. There was um, a time at which it was necessary to do something very important for Wi-Fi security, and we created Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA. You might also know it by its underlying protection protocol, TKIP. Um, with 802.11n, um, TKIP reached its age. And I could, I could talk at great length about why we had to do this, but um, TKIP is not possible to be used with 11n. You have to use WPA2. So it's dead. And when I was trying to find an image that illustrated dead really nicely, I went to Flickr and I, I said, show me images of death. And there were a lot of things that didn't have a lot to do with death. And I came across this incredible photo series, um, one of which I've done here. This, this picture is called Death by Chocolate. Um, and it's, I, was, I was taken with it because the idea that a stormtrooper would be crushed by a giant Hershey bar, I just, I could not resist sharing. Um, there's a whole set of these. I, I really encourage you to look at them. Um, it's, uh, it's done by an artist in, um, in Austin named J.D. Hancock, and um, there are stormtroopers playing Twister, so I really, I cannot recommend this enough. I found it incredibly amusing, and I almost wanted to redesign my whole presentation around his, his stormtrooper series, but I didn't. Um, <clears throat> For, uh, so for Wi-Fi purposes, the, the key with security is you're going to have to move to WPA2 to use 11N data rates. Um, if you have an existing network that's already um, using WPA, you've got to plan for that transition. There are some tools that will help you reconfigure large numbers of clients. So it is possible to do um, without having to um, spend a lot of time touching every device. Something else you'll need to do, in and this crosses the boundary between a project plan and a deployment plan, is you have to figure out what channels to use. With um, 802.11n, there, there's really no change to how you lay out channels in the old 2.4 gigahertz band that was used by 802.11b and g. You still have three. Um, it's possible to use wider channels with um, the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, there's some coexistence mechanisms that are defined in 802.11n um, that allow you to do that without interfering with your neighbors too much. Um, the trouble with it is that um, when you only have about 80 megahertz of spectrum in that 2.4 gig band, you really it's not possible to use 40 megahertz channels um, in any sort of a network of large scale. And um, so the, the trade-off there is um, you get higher peak speed, but you get total over, lower network throughput overall because you have less radio capacity due to the way that, that the overlap works. Um, and it's an option. It's available. Um, it's generally not used on anything other than a home network. Another reason is you do need to use the wider channels in order to get higher speeds. That's um, often a, a big driver for moving to 11N. Um, some of the first users of 802.11n that I came across were hospitals that were doing medical imaging, and they were doing that over um, the, the wider channels in the 5 gig band. Um, <clears throat> 
when you do this, it doesn't dramatically change the number of users you have. It makes more capacity available. Um, and what that means depends actually a lot on how the network is used. Um, it might mean that you get more users. It might mean that users of the network send more data. And so what you wind up doing is delivering more data to the same number of users. So that depends a lot on what you expect users to be doing and how the network is going to be used. The, um, the next thing you have to worry about as you do this channel planning um, is that um, it, it's necessary to not overlap with your neighbors. So you want to try and have um, a, a channel plan that doesn't have overlap. And the, one of the ways this is commonly described is that um, there's something called the four-color map theorem, which says that no matter what shape you draw, you, all you need is four colors. And the same thing is, is true in Wi-Fi. What you're doing is you're saying, I have this, this map of coverage areas, and I want them all to be different channels. In the beginning with, um, with 802.11n, um, by using the wider channels, uh, you wound up with fewer channels. And there were so few that it wound up um, making it difficult to lay out channels. Um, the success of Wi-Fi led to a lot of additional spectrum being made available. Um, so now there is a wide variety of, or there's, the, there's a larger number of available channels. And it's generally possible to lay out a network with 40 megahertz channels um, for that maximum speed. Um, there are a lot of um, automated tools that help you do that. Um, if you're building a relatively large network, the, um, the large-scale network products that um, you use to build that kind of a network um, <clears throat> are um, available or have automatic tuning capabilities built in. So they'll look at their neighbor neighbors and try and converge on, a, uh, on an optimal channel plan. When you get down to building the network, you have to um, actually get to the point where you pick out products. Um, and I'll say a couple of words about this. Um, there's a lot that I could say, um, but I knew I was going to, to try and fit this into an hour. So if you're interested in this as a follow-up, let me know. I'm going to have my contact information up here at the end. Um, when you talk about a protocol stack, you have, say, the, the ISO model, which I've shown here. You see the layers of protocols. Um, in, the, in the ISO and the, the telephone networking world, there are also these, these layers are separated out into um, what are called planes. And you have um, different parts of the network that, that serve different purposes. So you have the data plane. And that is a set of protocols that are layered, and they deliver data. You put a packet into one end of the data plane, it comes out the other. There is um, also something called the management plane. And that's a protocol stack that helps you configure and monitor what the network is doing. Um, in the IP world, um, a lot of management is done over SNMP. Um, the trickiest one to describe is what's called the control plane. Part of the reason it's tricky to describe for a wireless network is that capabilities that you need on a network of any size, things like how do you have devices move between APs? Um, how do you have devices automatically select channels? How do you um, manage user authentication to the network? Um, these are all critical problems that have to be solved. and the standards that are used in the Wi-Fi world, they basically standardize the data plane. And you get the management plane from your vendor. The control plane uh, can take on a variety of forms. And there are trade-offs that, that get made in product design that affect how you have to build the network with something. Um, the big um, debate going on in the industry right now is about how um, 
whether uh, these individual planes need to be centralized and all in one place or distributed out to multiple devices where they can cooperate um, and um, have uh, potentially better scalability. So looking at the time, um, the final thing I wanted to talk about is how we're getting to gigabit Wi-Fi. And this is something that is not exactly related to 11N, but it's cool, so I like to talk about it. The um, 802.11 working group has started another task group, and they're producing a standard which was originally targeted at offering gigabit throughput, um, but the draft right now actually goes up to seven. And seven gigabits is a lot. The first release of products um, is probably going to be, just like with 11N, not using the full capability of the draft standard, and so it will be around a gigabit. And the way you get to this speed is um, you have a higher number of data streams. So rather than having four data streams over the same radio channel, you can have up to eight. Um, the channels themselves get even wider. So in addition to 20, which we've had forever, 40, which we have in 11N, um, we now add 80 and 160 megahertz. And the same trade-offs will apply with these wider channels. You can improve the speed um, even further at the cost of having fewer channels and making the, the channel layout um, a little bit more um, difficult to do uh, both uh, either manually or automatically. Um, something I haven't talked about very much is um, how you actually determine, how you actually put ones and zeros onto the radio link. Um, and the, the process for that is called modulation. Um, there's a whole coding process that you go through, um, which is called QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Um, and what you wind up doing is you wind up saying, I'm going to, to pick a very precise combination of amplitude and frequency, and I'm going to use that to encode bits. And the easiest way to do it is to just encode one bit at once. Um, you can encode more um, by using what are called constellations. Um, if you look on YouTube for um, a video I did explaining error vector magnitude, it will actually explain how, how the whole QAM process works. And the way that, um, way that 802.11ac, this gigabit standard, will be using um, improved coding is that it will demand a higher and higher fidelity of uh, constellation points. And if this is something you're interested in hearing more about, uh, let me know and perhaps I can do a webcast just on how we get bits onto the wire. And saving the best for last, um, something in, the, um, in this new forthcoming gigabit standard that's really interesting is called multi-user MIMO. I talked about MIMO this morning as a way to get bits from one end of a link to the other. This new gigabit standard is combining this capability with something called beamforming, where you can, in essence, focus the energy in a particular direction. And that allows you to transmit different frames in different directions at the same time. So if you have receivers that are um, not in the same place in space, you can transmit to them at the same time. And this is doing for Wi-Fi what switching did for Ethernet. So just as a switch took the collision area from a whole hub um, to just a port on the hub, multi-user MIMO is taking the collision domain for an AP from the entire surrounding area to being focused on a smaller subset of that so you can transmit multiple frames at the same time. Now this all has some really interesting implications for how you build product, but if I didn't have time to really describe how this new standard is working, um, I certainly don't have time to, um, to discuss um, how we're going to build products based upon it. Um, what I will observe, because I noticed that early on in the webcast, somebody asked me um, a question of, when is my next book coming out and what is it going to be about? It's going to be about this new gigabit standard. Um, 
and um, I am um, in the process of launching a new product at work right now. Um, we're in the home stretch, and when that product is launched, then I'll be able to devote a little bit more time to writing the book. Um, I think um, it's likely it will be out early next year, but you can't, um, you can't get me to commit to that just yet. At this point, um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming and listening. Um, there is a special offer that I coordinated with the marketing department at Arrowhive, which is that um, they um, wanted to show their support for my webcast, and they set up a special page. I've reproduced the link here. Um, if you go to www.arrowhive.com slash 802.11n, that will take you to a page where you can put in, um, the, put in your information, and um, the first 50 people who register at that link will receive a free copy of the 802.11n book. Um, and as I say on the slide, uh, don't thank me. Thank the Arrowhive Marketing Department. They're the ones who bought the books. At this point, we're getting kind of close to the end, so I wanted to make sure to get my contact information up there. Um, you have an email address. Um, you can uh, follow me on Twitter or ask me questions there. Um, and I do blog for Arrowhive. Um, I do have a phone on my desk. I don't like to use it. Um, so you can call me, but um, it may or may not be um, <clears throat> It may or may not be possible to get me to pick up at any point in time. I also travel quite a lot um, for my job seeing customers throughout the world, um, so there's no guarantee I'm actually going to be at my desk at any point in time. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm watching the, the questions that have come in, and so I'm, I'm going to, uh, to take questions um, at this point um, until Yasmina cuts me off. Um, and um, so the, the first question that I'll take is um, a question that says, does eight data streams mean that we have to expect up to eight, eight antennas per radio? And the answer is absolutely. Um, this is one of the challenges in um, designing the ultimate high-speed gigabit Wi-Fi product is that, um, yes, we'll have to have that many antennas, um, and putting that many antennas into the same case is a really interesting hardware engineering problem. Fortunately, um, from a product design perspective, um, it's, not a, it's, it, it's not a challenge we have to solve right away. That eight data stream world um, comes um, after some significant, after the first couple of waves of chips hit the market. So just as the first wave of 802.11n was only two stream, um, the first wave of 802.11ac is likely to only be four stream. And so therefore, um, we only have to design products that will have uh, four antennas per radio initially. Um, but you're right, that is absolutely something that we would have to expect, and that makes it interesting to be a radio engineer in Wi-Fi right now. The um, next question um, is about specific configuration and equipment recommendations for a small network using 802.11n with a single IP. And one of the really interesting things about this question is that um, the, it, it depends a lot on what you're using the network for. Um, that um, a home network probably only has a single IP, um, or at least it does in um, San Francisco where I live, and you just don't get big houses. But even then, it, you could break that down based on why that network is being set up. Um, so that if I were to use a single AP to put in 802.11n as an extension of my corporate network, that would be a very different problem than if I was setting up 802.11n for uh, my parents' house. Um, generally speaking, for um, small networks, especially if you um, don't have neighbors that you're overlapping with, um, by all means, go for that 40 megahertz channel. It will give you higher speed. 
um, and you want to, to turn on um, turn on that capability. Um, make sure that what you're buying is 802.11n. Um, so you, you want um, to make sure that both your AP and your um, and the devices you're connecting to it um, support 11n. Um, 11n does work with um, with older devices, so it does work with 802.11abg, provided that you have the right frequency band. Um, but um, it, um, it it does um, only go at the speed of that older technology. Um, probably the most important thing when you're doing this is to make sure that you're using WPA2 because that way you actually get the speed of 11N. I mean, this may mean that you have to touch every device on your home network in order to um, get it to the point where it can use the 11N speeds. Um, wow, a couple more questions. Um, <clears throat> so, um, a question on what was the Arrowhive URL? So I'll go back to that page. Um, it's arrowhive.com slash 802.11n. Um, and a comment that it doesn't show states for Canada. Um, and I think it actually does. Um, when I looked at the, at the page last night, um, it's a two-letter abbreviation. And so I'm pretty sure that for ex when I looked, I did notice there was an AB, which would be Alberta, um, because um, it's uh, Alabama is AL. Um, so I think it does have a two-letter province abbreviation for Canada. If I'm wrong about that, um, please feel free to send me an email. And um, looks like the last question that I'm going to have time for is, could you give us a link about um, building, taking MIMO into consideration? And um, I think the, I'm not aware of anything off the top of my head. Um, if you're interested in building a network that, that uh, takes into account MIMO, um, there are um, a number of companies um, my own included, that offer um, planning tools that will enable you to import a floor plan for a building and then um, use that to lay out a network. Um, and uh, many of these tools are available freely to you. Um, you do have to sign up for them, but it, uh, it's a, certainly an option that you have. Fantastic, Matthew. I'm not seeing any additional questions. And with that, we are going to wrap up the event today. And folks, we'd like to let you know the URL, many of you are asking about that. Where do you go to get the books? It should be open in another window on your computer. So if your pop-up blockers are on, uh, you might want to let it uh, go for this one. It'll take you to the site where you can um, get the books. Matthew, thank you for an outstanding webcast presentation, for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. It was great, great to be here. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending and hope you've benefited from today's webcast. We do have a lot of interest from people in this topic, 802.11n, so we are going to try to get with Matthew and see if we can get him to commit to maybe another webcast or two for you all. And we will let you know about that in a couple of emails, and you can always visit O'Reilly.com, look on the webcast page for all of our upcoming events. Again, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's webcast. Goodbye, everybody.